calling tonight's meeting to order. Welcome. It is Thursday, December 19th, and tonight is the business meeting for the Scarborough School Board. May I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Ms. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Mr. Bennett? Here. And if you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Seeing none. 5.0, public comments on the agenda items. If you have any comments that are not connected to the public um, discussion about the steering committee's recommendation regarding the primary schools, if you could please come to the podium, state your name and your address. Hi, Kelly Murphy, 5 Woodfield Drive. I just want to recognize Joanne's retirement. Um, I first met Joanne in 1988 when she was my math teacher. Um, we were all a little terrified because the new principal was about to be our math teacher. And it was not um, my favorite class, but it ended up being my favorite class that year. We learned actually useful skills about the stock market. We had to write letters to boards of directors of public companies to get their annual reports and then buy stocks and then follow them in the newspaper every day <laughs> and track them. And it was actually one of the most useful classes I ever took, and that was in eighth grade. And then years later, I had kids, came back, and Wentworth School is falling apart. <laughs> I went to a meeting of angry parents, and there was Mrs. Sizemore trying to chill everybody out as the interim superintendent. <laughs> um, we spent thousands of hours together on the building committee, and when I later was on the school board, and it took me five years to call her Joanne and not Mrs. Sizemore, and it still feels wrong, but... Um, <laughs> Nobody knows more about the ins and outs of education in Scarborough than Joanne. And she'll be terribly missed. And this room is going to look weird without you, but good luck and good work. Thank you, Kelly. My name is Jackie Perry. I live at 215 Black Point Road in Scarborough. I'm not certain if I voted to hire Joanne as a teacher, but I know I voted to hire Joanne as an administrator. Whether you know it or not, Joanne transitioned Scarborough from a junior high to a middle school. She taught our teachers at the middle school how to deal with children as opposed to subjects. My first personal encounter shows Joanne in her greatest light. In the old days, members of the Board of Education took a piece of, or, or two, of the budget and really familiarized themselves. And I was assigned the middle school and I had an appointment with Joanne to meet about the budget. And I walked in and there's Joanne cleaning lockers with three young boys. And she saw me and she said to the boys, well, I have a meeting now, so take the paraphernalia, whatever it was, to the janitor and, and wait for you. They had it. She had already arranged a ride for them. But she said, I'm going to leave my door open so I can watch you. So we went into her office and I said, uh, what's going on? She said, well, they kind of marked up the lockers and they needed to be cleaned. And I said, and why are you there? She said, I'm teaching them how to do it. You can't just tell middle school children to go clean those lockers. You have to show them how to do it. And you have to show them by being there that it's what they did that was wrong, that they're not wrong, that they're not bad children. That shows me who Joanne is and why she has been such a great educational leader. And if you had ever seen her in a faculty game of basketball in her spandex, oh God. 
and the faculty, the guys bringing the ladder out so she could crawl up the ladder and put the basketball Slam in. Slam dunk it. <laughs> or cooking hamburgers and hot dogs when Tom Griffin had the children doing the walk run. She'd be there cooking the hot dogs and the hamburgers. She loves children, this community, and she has been one great leader. Joanne, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Jody Shea, uh, 23 Windsor Pines Drive in Scarborough. I too am here to recognize Joanne um, and thank her for her service, years and years of service here to our community. Um, while I'm incredibly thrilled for you, it's been a long time coming, I think, and, and you've, you've put our community and our school district ahead of yourself um, for many years. And so I'm thrilled for you, but I know it's a huge loss um, for our community, not only for all that you do and all the stories that um, have been shared, but the historical knowledge and the um, expertise in Scarborough. So I wish you luck. I hope thank there's you. lots of sunshine where you're going. Um, and thank you. It's been an honor to serve with you. Thank you. recognitions 6.1 our spotlight award winner you want to get the slideshow going so this is my first um, spotlight award as chair of the communications committee um, but thankfully I still retained Hillary who makes these amazing videos and makes all of this possible um, Kristen and I went to Wentworth to take the video and everyone at Wentworth had such wonderful things to say about Cheryl. Um, I did see her come in. She's, she's such a wonderful, special person and every, it, was, it was so evident that every single one of our faculty that has the pleasure of working with her um, feels so proud and honored to go to work every day and be a part of what she does. Um, I reached out to Allison Marchese um, with a few questions and she sent me something that she would like me to read. So it says, I am so sorry I cannot be there tonight as Cheryl's commitment is exactly what the Spotlight Award represents. Through, though LAMP had been introduced with other students last year, Cheryl through her work with our Functional Life Skills K-5 students has worked with the teams of service providers to incorporate and generalize, generalize LAMP within the classrooms as well as the schools with the indi and individual students. Visit Eight Corners and Wentworth School Playgrounds to see the communication boards for all students to use as well as the word of the week signage displayed around the buildings. In addition, Cheryl has led in advocacy for creating a way to support students having iPads and LAMP applications to use at home and in the community, as this is their communication system. Cheryl is another example of the dedicated staff that we have for our students and our families. I feel honored to work with her. Congratulations, Cheryl. So without further ado, we will play her video and find out who nominated Mrs. Milliken.
Cheryl Milliken has made a huge impact in my classroom. My name is Nancy Carroll, and I'm the functional life skills teacher for grades K2 here in Scarborough. Cheryl has given a voice to some of my students where before they didn't have a voice, they used behaviors to communicate. Since introducing LAMP in my classroom, my behaviors have decreased hugely, and communication has increased hugely. Not only has she done that in my classroom, she's responsible for getting that core board outside on the playground so that all students understand how to communicate with my students and with each other. She also has introduced a word of the week that the whole school is involved in. My kids are not isolated as much as they were thanks to Cheryl. I can't say enough good things about how much good she does for the students because imagine if I could not communicate this message to you and we could not communicate to her how much she's appreciated. So, Cheryl Milliken. Thank you for giving us voices. Thank you, Cheryl. Looks like the home screen of LAMP. Um, what we added in was all of the things that you can do on the playground down here. So when we come out with our students, we come over here, uh, we find I play surfboard. And then we go over to the sorts board so that the kids can play. And um, kids are able to come over here with their friends and their peers and talk to them and communicate with them. And it's been great. Hi. Cheryl has been great in our room. She has really worked behind the scenes with admin to get our kids things that they need that the district didn't necessarily provide right away. And she's also great as a collaborator and as a coworker. We love you, Cheryl. I say, Cheryl, I know you're here. I saw you. We have a certificate and a t shirt. Thank you so much. <laughs> They're both here. Oh, yeah, I got a Kelly. I got a Kelly. Yeah. Ready? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, here. Let me just do it real quick. Kelly's having technical difficulties. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I work for a technology company. <laughs> um, 6.2, I'd like to recognize two of our um, Scarborough Middle School teachers um, for their national board certification. Will Cabana, who is a sixth grade social studies teacher, 
and Molly Fahan, who is a sixth grade science teacher. If you could please stand up so we can recognize you. Um, Molly and Will are two teachers in our district who are nationally board certified right now and currently I think there's one other so out of all of our teachers um, they are nationally board certified and we have three in the district at this time so it's a big accomplishment congratulations Joanne can you explain what how that's different from a, 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 a regular teacher certification and, and what it takes to get that? Yep. It's a program that um, is nationally known and teachers um, apply to participate in it and spend two mm -hmm. years doing uh, work with other colleagues throughout the state and then taking some boards and so forth and then they receive the certification. Congratulations. Oh. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh God. This whole week has been very emotional. <laughs> yeah. I was going to save this to the end, but I, on behalf of all of us, um, I want to take a moment to speak about Joanne Sizemore, who will be retiring at the end of the month. Tonight marks Joanne's final board meeting, and it is with, with mixed emotions we are saying goodbye to her. Joanne has been a part of Scarborough Schools for 42 years, first as a math teacher in our junior high school, then as the much love an occasionally much feared middle school principal, and finally as the assistant superintendent for the last 10 years. In addition to all this, she has also served as interim superintendent on more than one occasion. Joanne has done it all with grace, commitment to excellence, and a passion for her craft. Her love for Scarborough and our students is evident in all the decisions she has made over the years at the classroom, building, and district levels. She has been dedicated to improvements throughout the district, and Joanne is always willing to share her knowledge with teachers who strive to become future administrators themselves. She has shown tireless support of our staff at every opportunity. Joanne has worked with numerous boards over the years, providing wisdom, knowledge, insight, and humor. Each of us appreciates her willingness to listen and spend countless hours as our resource. She has guided us in becoming a highly functioning and effective board of education, and her experience and support was invaluable as our team searched for a new superintendent in this past spring. As a new chair with less than a year of service, I would have been lost without your support over this past year as I got my feet under me. I promise what I have learned from you will be shared with future board members so your legacy will be continued. It is clear that Joanne Sizemore has had a wonderful career in Scarborough. Her experience and leadership will be missed at every level in every building. Joe, you have impacted so many people in your tenure, inspiring them to find their passion, whether it be in teaching, the arts, or wherever their hearts may lead them. It seems appropriate that our gift for you was custom designed by a former Scarborough student, Amy Saroy of Salt Air Designs. We hope you take this piece of Scarborough with you to remember all of us as you embark on your journey into retirement. And please, don't change your phone number. <laughs> this is your... a very emotional week. Uh, it started on Monday and it hasn't stopped and um, I was doing fine up until Monday probably around 4 and then uh, I kind of like lost things. But I just want you to know that it, ha it has been with mixed emotions that I decided to retire from, retire from Scarborough Schools. I've had an absolutely wonderful career and feel very lucky to have worked in a place where going to work was inspiring, fun, and no two days were ever the same. The students, staff, parents, and community have given me the inspiration to do what is right for students. 
The staff have been dedicated and have been willing to engage our learners in opportunities. On Tuesday, we no, Wednesday, because we had a snow day, <laughs> went home early that day. Um, we had a, um, I want to thank the school community for a wonderful retirement reception for staff of Scarborough Schools. There is many laughs, stories uh, that were shared with my 43 years with so many of the K-12 staff. Of course, the middle school staff had many tales <laughs> to tell about my times and my routines, especially our program of community school and self, which they told them when I left middle school, you could do whatever you want with the program. But while I was there, we were doing it. <laughs> um, so I wish all of you the um, best of happiness, success, good health, and do enjoy what you're doing and be happy. Work does become part of your life and will create many good memories for you. It's been a pleasure to be part of the Scarborough School community. Thank you very much. So 7.0 is our public forum tonight. Um, really excited about the turnout to talk about the presentation that the Building Steering Committee had provided to us. Um, we have, oh, maybe not. Um, we were going to have a couple of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a few slides that the Building Steering Committee is going to be sharing with us um, about their recommendation, and then we'll be opening this up for public comment. And we'll see again my technology skills, how they do. Oh, you get that. Sorry, I'm a Mac kind of girl, so this is a little tough. There we go, it's a little chill. All right. Is it not coming up? No. Yeah, we're, we're still plugged in and everything's there. <coughs> oh, there, there it is. There it is. <laughs> nope. Oh, Kelly. Kelly, the screen's going up. <laughs>
uh, kid who has run out of space. And what this slide is talking about is that by the uh, Department of Education recommendations, all of the spaces are below standard. Uh, and that really speaks to just the age of those buildings and the growth of the town. So we hope this is people want to live here. Um, the other issue that's happening is there are space needs that were never conceived of for built. Things like STEM. There are no STEM spaces. Or STEAM, sorry, engineer. STEAM. Um, there are also no spaces for things that have come up. Um, IEP meetings, 504 meetings, there are uh, a lack of spaces for adults to meet. Also, um, some issues around privacy, um, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, need to take place in spaces that are not really ideal, like this picture here is a corridor. Um, and it sort of talks a little bit about societal implications of seeing someone on display, as well as just really what the legal implications are when these things need to be protected. Um, think of things like HIPAA. Um, next issue is safety and security. And this is unfortunately has to do with the changing world of the event. Some of these issues are about you know lockdown issues or you know doors that are were originally fine in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, design shades have changed. They need to be properly swinging and lockable from the inside so that if there is a demand for a lockdown in school, God forbid ever, um, this needs to currently, you just have to go out to the hallway, physically lock from the outside and go back in, which is not really a reasonable way to do it. Once they're in the room, there's really no way to get out because the, the, most of these buildings all have casement windows, um, which don't have enough place and space for people to get out of that room. Um, some of the spaces have windows, uh, you have to climb up on bookshelves and desks to get to, to above the shades. Not really a very smart thing ever. Um, and many of them don't have um, basic um, functionality in terms of what I think of as emergency access. Um, there's no lane around the building for fire or police to get around there. Um, there's not a lot of good ways for people to get, children especially, to get off the campus in the state of emergency. And there's a commingled parent, teacher, student, bus drop off and pick up area, which is functionally a very unsafe situation at the beginning and the end of the day. It, press it again, I think. It, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so our issue now is that's where we were. This is sort of where we're stepping to, and that is increasing enrollment. And so what we're seeing here is a graphic, which is a little bit not to, it's not to scale. Uh, what the large rectangle represents is our existing schools. The smaller rectangles represent uh, the needs for additional classroom space. Uh, the white ones are ones that are in place now, and the black ones are ones that we need to have. Um, these are temporary buildings. They don't address some of the core safe spaces, like um, additional rooms for uh, gym or art or cafeteria um, or any of the adult spaces. This is just a direct instructional space. So as we're looking at this future with more children and uh, squeeze on space, we looked at a number of ways to get out of the situation. And the first one we looked at is just what are we doing now? Can we continue doing that? And that's really the use of temporary classrooms or what you call it portables or modulars. Um, it's not a holistic solution. You know, it doesn't address any of those safety concerns we were just talking about. Um, it's not really a true classroom. It's sort of substandard in that way. Um, they are meant to be temporary. Um, it, it doesn't address any of those central core spaces. It just addresses the direct instructional areas. Um, it does buy time, so mm -hmm. that, that's basically what it's getting us. It's getting us uh, enough space for our children to be instructed properly in terms of a student-teacher ratio, but it's not getting um, a, a full holistic uh, uh, solution. Uh, it does keep the schools where they are in the neighborhoods. So everyone knows where the schools are. They're staying there right now. Uh, but there's not enough land for all those in the black squares. Um, there's an issue with that. Um, and it doesn't realize any sort of operational efficiency that looking at another solution might. So it's sort of a, it's a stopgap to the end day. This is what we consider a non-viable non-solution. And I think the statistic that's up there speaks a lot that in just almost just a short five years, almost half of the primary students will be in temporary uh, buildings. So that sort of paints a picture of not what I expect from my district, and so that sticks with me pretty strongly. So the first solution to this, potentially, is an option one, which is just renovating, expanding those existing schools, um, improving what's there now. Um, but there are some issues there. Um, one is if you're building a building and renovating something during the school year, you have to slide and ship to children. So that means we 
we're phasing that approach. Uh, we have children in a construction site, essentially. So in the amount of time this will take, uh, the children who start when the construction starts will graduate from that building. There will still be construction going. They'll live through construction site. Um, it doesn't address the existing spaces that are unsized, uh, undersized. It will be able to add new classrooms at the current the correct size and ratio. It'll add additional spaces that are missing, say art rooms or um, steam areas or bubble or those sort of missing spaces. Um, but it doesn't um, also it doesn't also allow for that sort of increased efficiency from the operations point of view. And it still leaves us with a number of safety concerns. Uh, there still won't be an aisle around that building. It's still where it is. In fact, it's probably going to be a little bit worse because we're going to be expanding that building. Um, some of the places we were looking at, it seemed like there probably needed to be a second floor added to hit the numbers that we need to. So it's a, it's a tight, tight fit in most of these spaces. <coughs> the second option, of course, is um, consolidation, a new school. Um, it's really the, the blank slate, so we can make everything the right way the first time. Um, we can add the classrooms for every child that's the right size. We can get all the shared spaces <coughs> that we need and we've talked about. Um, the other thing is it helps increase the operational efficiency of the school system because we have one space to maintain, one space to bring children and goods and services all to. Um, and it really does avoid a lot of the deferred maintenance that we're going to be experiencing in the older school buildings as we go along. You know, the building is old, it has an old boiler, um, it will need to be fixed. That cost is being sort of put off right now, and if we don't just move the new option, with So I can just sort of the other part of uh, what we looked at, those are very much about functional spaces and costs, thoughts. Um, the other thought we had was, well, what does it mean to bring all these children to one space? Um, we did do a, a little bit, as much as we could. We're not research scientists, but we did use the interweb and look and see um, what researchers were we'll talking about, impacts of school size. Um, what we all found is that really when people are talking online and the studies that large, um, we don't qualify as large. These numbers all sort of fall within what they would call small. And we have within very short striking distance, including the building right out back, um, four of the top five schools in the state at this level. And you can see the Falmouth is um, rather large. And they're all very successful spaces. Um, one of the things that we did find is that a potential impact of increasing the size of school is absenteeism. And I can't speak to all the school districts and say this was absolute certainty, but the, what we see within Scarborough is that there was is not a different degree of absenteeism amongst the schools by the number of children. So we think that that's a really good indicator that changing from a smaller to a unit to the consolidated school will have that sort of impact. Really, the biggest indicator we saw everywhere was student-teacher ratio was happening at that classroom size. <coughs> so our recommendation to the school board has been to proceed looking at consolidated new primary school. Uh, provides that best environment, <coughs> it manages enrollment increases, gives us opportunity for flexibility for future spaces, um, and addresses all the deficiencies we've already speaking, spoken about, including uh, security. Uh, it also gets off, uh, allows us to improve drop off, um, and give us full owner staff in front of us with a lot of physical site constraints that we currently have. And also the last point there, I think it's important one. It gives us a potential way to mitigate some overcrowding at the other schools, which is um, part of one of the other additional recommendations we gave to the school board. Um, one was for the request for a qualification from designers. Um, it's part of the state process to go through here that we need to have um, an advertisement the paper to looking for people to help us with the next steps. Uh, we'll be getting <coughs> putting this in the newspaper soon, hopefully. Um, getting responses from some new designers is possible to help us in our process. Uh, we'll short less on this sort of another big process to find that. But I really want to get to this last point, which is we're hoping that we can use this project to also reduce current overcrowding in the middle school, because currently the sixth grades are all in temporary levels as well. And we're hoping that we can use this project to solve more than just the gated tuition, that we can solve more problems in one time. So takeaways. Um, the K-2 right now are below state standards in size. 
um, the addition of temporary structures and temporary classrooms is not physically viable. Um, it's not physically responsible, in our opinion, or a safe solution doesn't improve the security environment. Um, right now, without any other changes, we're on track for almost half of our students to be in temporary classrooms. And renovation of the existing facilities are not going to be a holistic, not going to solve all the issues that we face. Um, but <coughs> consolidation, we do believe, uh, pursues the option that gives us the greatest long term value uh, for the students and the community. So, I mean, so I'll leave that out. All right. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, what we'd like to do now is invite the community to come up and share their thoughts. Um, we'd ask that keep your comments to three minutes. What we will do is have everybody give everyone an opportunity to speak, and then we are going to go through those main themes and ask what are mitigation strategies um, or how we would be able to resolve some of the concerns that may be coming forward tonight. Does, would anybody like to start? Uh, good evening. I, I'm Jim Cupel, and uh, many years ago I attended these meetings in support of the Scarborough schools. But tonight I'm here as a, as a trustee of the Scarborough Public Library. And I, I, we're going to leave it to others to decide on the efficacy of the, the school consolidation. I'm here simply to clarify timing and to remind the community and the school board of the library expansion project. Uh, we outlined it in the June 5th letter to you all, and I'm sure you recall that the, the expansion project is scheduled next up in the facilities uh, master plan. And uh, the, it's already been funded by the capital improvement program. Our planning is well underway, and the architects have been on site. So, uh, more details in January if you want to come to the, uh, the public meeting. But uh, in, in addition to supporting the schools, uh, in supporting children and youth in the community, uh, the library is also an important resource to support seniors, businesses, and families. And so just uh, give us some more information in terms of timing and remember the uh, library. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Megan Fallon, um, I live on Sequoia Lane. And I just want to say that um, I volunteer in my children's classrooms or in school quite a bit at Eight Corners and I definitely see a need for um, a solution to be brought about for more space. And I trust that the committee has done their due diligence and looking into our best options for this project and I just wanted to say that um, I support it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sue Helms, 504 Desposites Avenue, and I find myself in a very unusual position right now because I'm a former principal for 14 years at Blue Point School. Um, I've been retired for about nine years now, and I find myself very much opposing this idea. I totally get how crowded things are. You don't have to do anything but ride by a corner school to see how crowded things are. I totally understand that. But I think there's another option that has not been raised, at least in anything that I've read. When we started putting modules at the K2 buildings, um, what was being talked about at that time was what about building a fourth K2 building in West Scarborough? because at that point, that was the only place that had any buildable land. I think a lot of it's been taken up by now, but um, it was the only place that had any buildable land. Um, I, I think in my heart and in my gut and in my experience, this building is too big for five, six, and seven-year-olds. If you look at the slide that you just put up, there was not one of those buildings that had just K2 kids. There was one that had K3, 
but all of the rest of them were up to five or K five or six. One of the things that our earliest learners need is a feeling of comfort and a feeling of security when they walk into their building. They need to feel at home there. They need to feel like it's their place. They need to feel comfortable there. And with a building that size, I don't think that's going to happen. My other concern, I have two other concerns. One is busing. When I was at Blue Point, I retired nine years ago. Um, when I was still there, the exception was a 45 minute bus ride for K2 students. It was not the rule by any means. It was the exception. S Town of Scarborough is one of the largest geographic districts in southern Maine. Our bus drivers do a wonderful job taking care of our kids, getting them to school in a timely fashion, but none of us, any parent and any little kid, wants to ride on a bus for 45 minutes to an hour in bad weather. And that, if you consolidate in one place and have to transport all of these kids from all over this big district to that one place, I'm afraid that it's going to become more the rule than the exception. My other idea would be if you look into building another K2 building, then you could do maybe a little bit larger than some of the K2s at the moment. You could have more space in the, excuse me, in the current K2s to put in some of those needing little instructional rooms, OT, OT, PT, speech and language, STEM, whatever it is. If you take, if you transfer enough kids, it would be a massive transfer, but it's gonna be a massive transfer if you consolidate them all together. If you build one building three times the size of any of the K2 buildings now, that is going to be a large tax burden on this town. If you build a small one, one third of what the size of, say, Wentworth is, it will take less time to build it. You'll be able to transfer children into a new facility and help improve some of the other things that need to be done at the other K2 buildings with a lot less expense to the taxpayers than it would be to build another very, very large building that I honestly, in my heart, do not think is a good solution for K2. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Anna Joy Bannon. I live on uh, 9 Colby Drive in Scarborough. Um, so I am actually for this um, new consolidated space. Uh, my two children are actually currently at Wentworth, so um, even though they are you know, beyond the primary school levels, um, I wanted to make a note on a like, social and emotional level that um, I remember by the end of um, first grade for both my children who, um, you know, I can say that very well, you know, um, emotionally um, set and they um, had a lot of friends, but by the, even the start of second grade, being stuck with a small same group of kids for three years in a row makes it, um, it's a little bit taxing, it's a little bit tiring, and it wears down, and they have great friends, don't get me wrong, but on an emotional level, they were just so ready. They were just so ready to be able to move on and be with other kids that they knew from the other schools, and I just having, I think having that like, diversity like right off from the beginning um, doesn't mean that you can't still have smaller you know, groups, you know, maybe for the smaller, um, the younger ages, but um, you know, even speaking to a lot of parents who were you know, when we were in second grade going into third grade, so many parents that I spoke to said that their kids were, um, you know, they were getting so anxious about moving into Wentworth and um, 
they all, you know, I'm following up with them all afterwards, you know, how was school, and they loved it. And it's just thinking, you know, you get rid of that anxiety because you're, you're sheltering them, you know, right from the beginning. And, it, you know, it ended up the transition is fine. It ends up being fine. And they are exposed to so many more kids. And, you know, there's just so much more diversity, right? Um, you know, but they don't, shouldn't have to wait into third grade just to have that kind of, you know, social exposure to everyone and you know, more kids that they know. So um, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Pettit, Two Crossing Drive in Scarborough. Um, am I allowed to ask questions, or is that not till later? You can ask questions. <laughs> Bring them on. OK. So I, the slides did answer one of the questions, but I want to ask, has there been any consideration for it not being K-2 and expanding that? And the reason I say that is I have a proposal that I want to kind of think outside the box and keep the high school is 9 through 12 right, because they're situated. Use the middle school for pre-K and K. I think we need to factor in the conversation throughout the state that pre-K is coming. Um, Saco, Old Orchard, Biddeford, South Portland, they all have the, the public pre-K. So let's not build something and not factor in that we're gonna have to foster those 250 kids that are gonna be four years old. Um, so my proposal is to use the middle school for the pre-K and K make Wentworth a true middle school, fifth through eighth, and then build a first through fourth grade. So that's gonna do your pre-K all the way to K. And it'll eliminate the, the, um, the trailers, are they trailers, is that what we're calling? Modulars, Modulars. maybe a better <laughs> word for it, sorry. The extended buildings at the Wentworth that I know that are currently there, because you did talk about how Wentworth does need, is gonna need, not Wentworth, excuse me, the middle school is gonna need some assistance. So are you even at the point now that you're thinking outside the box or are we truly just solving K through two is the question. So we're looking at this through the lens of K through two. Um, that was sort of our charge, but we see that as well. That I think there are other committees who are looking for more of a long range plan. Um, and when we sort of move forward and get past this first stage, I think that would be something Discussions around pre K, <laughs> third, pre K, five, those things, we talked about them, um, but only to a sort of keep our own curiosity. Curiosity, sure. Not the answer to the question. Sure. I, and so I guess my charge is, is to let's not just do what we've always done. Right. Because I don't think that's going to suit us. And I am for this new school. I do think I, I love my little town, my little town school. I really do. And I have two little boys that are going to start in kindergarten, but we're also not a small town anymore. We're big, we're big. And so we're going to have these bigger schools and this bigger exposure and, and um, diversity. So we need to grow. The schools need to grow with how the town's growing, is my thought. And I also did some Google searching on numbers. And I'm going to throw out some numbers that we're, my hunch is, is as I throw them out, it's really going to be tough because I've got my little chart. Um, but the reason I propose the pre-K and K separate is because if you put them all in, that's a thousand kids school, if you did pre-K to fourth grade. And I do agree that that is a lot of little people running around <laughs> that don't even know where the bathrooms are. Um, so that was kind of where my mind went is, is if we can take the pre-K and K out. So right now, K through two is 560-ish kids. And if we added the fourth, it's, you're basically adding another 250 kids. And it's going to shuffle down all the way through because each class averages out to, the, to be that point. Um, so that was just kind of, again, my charge is, is to not do what we've always done. Thank you. Hold on, Andrea. Can you say it? Sorry. Can you say it one more time? Which you, the, the numbers? The no, the initial proposal. So pre-K so at school, the middle school. Keep high school nine through twelve. Yep. Um, use the middle school for pre-K and K. Yep and then make Wentworth fifth through eighth. Okay. And then build one through four. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wrote it down. Thank oh, you. and I do have something else. Oh, only because um, I have a friend who 
is a Cumberland County Deputy Sheriff. He's got a really long title. And he is posting about, you know, all the things that we're seeing in the country about these school shootings and all of that. And he made a point that, of course, we need to deal with the mental health of folks, but we also need to not build schools where it's a straight shot right down the hallway. I shouldn't say shot, sorry. But, <laughs> but I also want to make sure that as we do this, and it sounds like you're taking in all of that, this new world that we're living in into consideration, that um, we make sure we get the right professionals to pick their brains and make sure that we do this right. Thank, thank you. Well, I'll just add to it. We really appreciate the feedback and the research and everything. It's, uh, and we're definitely taking into consideration um, you know, what you brought up, and we will take into consideration um, even more. But um, you know, one thing that I wanted to just you know, add to that is there, there is another challenge associated with the um, first graders and younger in that they, by law, cannot be on a second floor. So, there will be more to the, the shuffling um, you know, concepts that we'll study, um, but that will be another part of the equation. Hi there. Um, I'm Carolyn Freeman for Thomas Drive in Scarborough. Um, I'm probably going to say I don't love public speaking, but this is how kind of how strongly I feel about this subject. Um, I have an interesting viewpoint um, from a parent perspective and also a teacher's perspective. Um, I actually worked in Wyndham under Sandy Prince um, in the primary school in third in kindergarten. Um, I taught and was also in ed tech. It is a giant school for K to three students. Um, it's big, and the little ones are lost half the time. Um, and you think some parents send their kids at four years old when their birthdays are in September, October, and some parents, you know, there's four and five year olds running around with eight and nine year olds. Um, when you talk about putting three separate schools together, that's how I, that's sort of how it will be when the schools come together is it's such, going to be such a large school that I feel like it's going to still be three separate schools, but just in one building. Um, because I worked in such a large school, from personal experience, I know that that's how it is. You don't know all the teachers' names, you don't know all the kids. Um, so I guess from a, and I will say from a kid perspective, for my son, um, going to a larger school just would not be good. Um, I think that, like uh, the earlier speaker said, it's a sense of community, it's where they start their school career, um, and I think if they start in a school that's too large and too overwhelming for them, it's. It's, I mean, I think I just think the sense of community of the neighborhood schools. I actually went to Pleasant Hill, so I know it's old. <laughs> um, but I just think that there's got to be another way besides just combining all three and throwing all those kids into one spot, um, because it is it's it's too it's too much for some of the younger ones. Um, so I think the neighborhood schools or maybe adding a fourth school for the younger kids is, I mean, is a is a good proposal. Um, I just think from experience of working in a huge school of over 800 kids. Um, you know, the principal doesn't know everybody's name. When I walk into Pleasant Hill, the secretary knows my daughter who's four. You know, it's just that those little bits and pieces of a neighborhood school that make you feel at home, um, make you feel comforted, especially when you're sending your kids there that you know that they need to feel safe and secure too. So that's just my piece. I just thought a little bit, because we didn't talk about this. This yeah. is one of those issues that came up in the pro and cons. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we talked about when we were looking around was the fact that um, one of the concepts that came sort of rose to the top is a way to deal with that particular issue. Right. Is this school within a school. And so I think one of the things, and this is looking ahead, this is design that's not done, these are thoughts that are not complete, right. but I want to feed you some ideas that maybe assuage your fear, um, that the sort of school within a school concept can maintain that sort of small cluster, and maybe the wings are still called a corners. Yeah. And, and so it can be a, a way to handle um, a building, a large footprint, mm -hmm. without making the space feels like it's lost its sense of community. Right. So I, I hear what you're saying. That's one of the things we've been talking about. I mean, I think we wouldn't feel like we'd solve the problem unless we could solve that particular issue. Right. Yeah, I just think from the point of view of sometimes we talk about so much of the structure and the money in this, I think it's important that we think about what is school really about, and it's the kid. Student so that's, success. yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, student success is yeah. our conversations a lot. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Carol. Jillian Trapini Half, 315 Beach Ridge Road. Um, I am also in support of this plan that you have proposed. I think it was very thoughtfully done, and I just want to say that 
having a child at Wentworth and at Eight Corners, um, Wentworth was done very, very well. If we could get some of those people on the planning, uh, that would be great. Um, my child feels uh, comfortable in his smaller school. It is really well laid out, really well done. Um, it does not feel like there are that many kids there when you walk in. Um, you know, I understand the concerns. I also went to a K through five. Um, I think in terms of age groups, that was fine for me. Um, things have changed, but um, there are plenty of communities that do K through five. So I think it is acceptable to put more than three grades in a school. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, Kelly Murphy, Five Woodfield Drive. Um, I like what I'm hearing, a lot of different um, suggestions from community members about um, you know, hearing the information from the steering committee and then synthesizing that and coming back with other ideas. I do just want to caution the committee um, one thing about um, repurposing buildings for other age groups. I was on the building committee for Wentworth and one of the big problems with that old Wentworth building was that it used to be a junior high. And so all the fixtures are made for junior high kids. And then when there were three to five, three through fifth graders there, um, it was just how you got water out of a water fountain was with a stool. Um, so you're not gonna pull out all the fixtures, for example, of the middle school to make it fit pre-K, K, because that's a huge expense. Um, it's funny, I don't really have a strong feeling one way or the other about um, consolidating the schools. When my kids went to Blue Point, we couldn't live closer to Blue Point than if we lived in the building. Um, when my <laughs> daughters went to kindergarten, Mrs. Helms pulled them screaming off of us. <laughs> we walked home and we could hear them crying in our yard. Um, so it's, we loved the little tiny school and, um, but Wentworth is, I'm not taking credit for this, but it's an amazing facility. <laughs> um, and it, really doesn't feel big when you're in it. Um, the separated wings make a really big difference. Kids feel really comfortable with the number of teachers in their community and with the students and there's reshuffling that happens now every year so you are exposed to kids that you didn't know the year before. Um, I look forward to more information from the steering committee. I think you've done a tremendous amount of work in a short amount of time and I know it's a long haul because um, I know from the time um, the building committee started for Wentworth, my son was in preschool and he was in third grade the day it opened. So good luck. <laughs> Hello. I'm Jenny Moskowitz. I live on Orchard Street. And um, I, uh, I, def I, I think I'm for the consolidation. Initially, when I first read about it, my my neighbor Andrea sent me, have you read this? Because my children are not in school yet and I don't get all those cool notifications. Um, I thought, oh, that's very sad because I also like the small school setting. However, when I thought deeper, and what did I do? I talked to my parents. Um, because I'm coming from a perspective of um, my family is kind of in the school system. So my mom retired from school bus driver. My dad was a janitor. He retired and then became a janitor because he's bored. <laughs> but anyhow, he thinks, obviously, about a lot of things. And my sister is a school nurse. And I, for a short time, I'm a social worker, but for, for a short time, I, I worked in a middle school here in Maine, not Scarborough. Um, so I kind of have a lot of different perspectives on it. And after talking about it with my parents, I was so surprised because I grew up in a very small town in the Oxford Hill School District, which is eight, eight towns. Um, so we, we went to a small school, but you know what? we had to share those personnel, and I remember that. And my dad even talked about that, being a janitor. My mom talked about that, being a school bus driver. And we did, I sat on the bus for an hour, and it was not fun. Um, but I felt like for eight towns, that was you know, kind of acceptable. Whereas one town in Scarborough, I felt like that is not acceptable. And I would like to see that improve. Um, so I love that taken into consideration. Um, but from a personnel perspective, I was a middle school social worker, and um, at the middle school that I was at, it was sixth and seventh grade, and actually their eighth grade, they were still middle school students, but they were housed at their new high school. So I had to walk with students uh, through that 
anxiety and exposure. And I perceive my daughter, who will be in kindergarten next year, to also have some anxiety about going to a big school. Because right now, if she goes to pre-K, I enrolled her in SACO, because not the public school system, but it's a private one. Um, but it's a very small pre-K. And I, I know, as Andrea spoke as well, and some other people have mentioned about pre-K, there's a need for that here. I would love my children to go to Scarborough and get to know um, who they're going to be going to school with long term, but the choices are so limited. And also, these kids are in tiny little programs. So it's not helping not having something in Scarborough. So then they'll be coming into this big school. I love the idea of a big, big school and that we can make it comfortable and small, and also to eliminate that anxiety as they grow. Because I don't, I don't want my kids to experience in middle school then having to go to a big school, or however it may pan out then. Um, and I, I do think that they're flexible and they can, uh, they can, they can learn to be okay with it, um, with a lot of um, exposure. Which brings up another point. Uh, the gentleman, I forgot his name already, that was talking about the library. We go to the library often. I love the Scarborough Library, and I think it's a really great way if somehow it can be thought about in these plans as to how to incorporate that, whether it's with pre-K, after school, before school, something. Because there are a lot of kids that go to the library that love it. We get so much from it, and I am so appreciative of the library, and the staff there are wonderful, top-notch. Um, and I would love to do more programming for little ones at the library as well. We go often. And it's a great way to introduce them to Scarborough and the community. So um, thank you very much. I think I hit all the points I wanted to say, but I didn't bring my notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Jennifer Ladd, and I live on Powderhorn Drive. Um, I'm a member of the planning board here in Scarborough, and I also sit on um, our town's transportation committee. Um, but I will say that most of my comments tonight are really coming from um, my job as a parent. Um, and, and some of my uh, just personal, um, professional experience. Um, <clears throat> I first, at, doing some similar volunteer work, I just want to say thank you to all of those of you on the board and those of you on the steering committee. I know that the schedule that you've been given is aggressive and you've been meeting frequently and there's a lot of work that goes on in between those meetings. And so um, I just want to express gratitude for that and make sure that um, nothing that I'm about to say is, is um, <laughs> taken in any other way than that. I'm, just, I'm here to, to bring up some points that I haven't heard yet um, tonight and that I also felt were really missing from the information that was presented um, in support of the consolidated school option. Um, so I, I fully understand and support the need for these improvements for our students. Um, and I think that the information presented on what is needed inside of these buildings, wherever they are and whatever they look like, is completely validated. Um, but the information as it was presented, I felt like was really biased against renovating our neighborhood schools. Um, of the eight options presented, six of them included closing one or all of our neighborhood schools. There was no option presented for a fourth neighborhood school and then phasing appropriate construction at the schools that we do have. No option presented for offering a pre-K program somewhere else, which I agree is desperately needed here. Um, no option for pre-K through one school with consolidation, you know, further on um, down the line, like we've heard some of the other options. And when the, the option B was presented, which is basically the renovation option, and option F presented the consolidation option, they were really, um, you know, when they were compared, I felt like they were, the, the renovation option was really painted in a negative light. Terminology used like, um, and this is from this is from the presentation. So for option B at Blue Point School, the new wing and parking would obliterate needed play areas. No parent drop off unless the playground is taken. Um, at eight corners, site is severely constrained. Requires parking overtaking a play area. Play area is inadequate. Um, site would have to be clear cut. Parking overtakes play area, which is just like really. It just feels really biased against that. And in comparison to the option presented for this consolidation plan where terms like extend, the whole campus benefits, 
these things are feasible and further studies will be done. Um, in addition, the graphics presented show that. They show that parking areas will be obliterated. But when you get to the consolidated option, it's a square that's shown where a future school might go here. So what does that look like? What does the parking lot for a 1,200 student school, what's that going to obliterate? Um, you know, there's definitely trade-offs that I think we're just missing from the conversation. Um, <clears throat> when you get to the point about comparing costs, there's a lot of information about building energy costs, um, but not much else. I come from a background in transportation. There was no mention anywhere of the transportation costs. What does our busing budget look like now, and what would that look like for, um, for moving all of the students from all corners of our very large community into the same place? Um, <clears throat> the uh, you, talk, you talk about the consolidation option as a, as a savings of 33,000 square feet and about $2 million. Um, but why isn't the renovation option just right-sized to, to build the same amount? You know, if, you're, if the consolidated school would be smaller in footprint, why don't we just renovate less space? Um, that, didn't, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And do those costs include off-site improvements, road construction, the expansion that was talked about at the middle school. Um, a building of this size in a school in the west would have significant impacts to the traffic situation in our community, which is bad now and getting worse. Um, and the problem with that is that we have a choice about what to do with our schools. We don't have a lot of other choices when it comes to transportation in town. So to use Oak Hill for an example, um, that intersection is not functioning well now, and to add the traffic that would be associated from a school like this if it were to be somewhat located um, in this area uh, would, would really strain that intersection in a pretty significant way. All of that you know, can be, um, I understand that there are compromises to be given, but I felt like that it's a discussion point that just wasn't, we haven't heard anything about that. Um, the, the best way to mitigate those kind of traffic problems is to divert traffic away from that place. And that is what these separated schools do right now. They disperse traffic. So you are not, you are not um, drawing everybody into the same place because we are able to park and walk from our homes or carpool with our neighbors. Um, that's an option that becomes available <coughs> for someone else if they live very close to the consolidated school, but, but basically makes that <coughs> unattainable for the vast majority of the people in, in the community. And certainly the length of time that very young students would be on a bus should certainly be a factor. Um, the Press Herald had a great article this week, actually on Monday, about the this, this status of um, emissions in our state and how much of the current um, emissions are coming from transportation. They estimated it to be about 29%. So that's pretty significant. I understand talking about building efficiency and costs for maintaining and running a building like that, but but that's you know let's talk about the transportation costs. And I think that's twofold. Part of it is the municipal budget for transportation, but also if I as a parent felt like I didn't want my kindergartner on a bus for an hour in the morning, that means I'm driving him there. So there's a cost associated with that too, both monetary and my time, additional childcare. It's, you know, there's a lot of other ripple effects that I think um, are relevant and should be part of this conversation that maybe just aren't yet. Um, and lastly, so that's sort of like boring facts and stuff like that, but I, I feel so strongly that our neighborhoods at schools are such an important part of our community here in a way that you cannot put a price tag on. Um, if we make the choice to consolidate our schools and uh, ab abandon or close the neighborhood schools that we have, that's a community presence in our neighborhood that we will not get back. The, the town is never going to come back and buy up four single family homes to, um, to reintroduce a presence like that in a neighborhood, whether it be for a school or some other municipal use. I know in our neighborhood, we use the playground behind the school all the time. In the winter, there's kids sledding. Um, you know, we, we, we go there even on snow days. <laughs> um, <coughs> we, we park there, you know, we, we park on the roads and we walk through the path. We take care of the path as a community. You know, there's coordination that goes on. Hey, a tree fell down over, during the storm over the path. Anybody willing to go out and help, you know, help clean it up? We're doing that. 
Um, and so, you know, just the idea of spending that extra time in my day with chatting with other parents on the playground instead of sitting in my car at a traffic light waiting to pick my son up, um, that's important to me. And I know it's important to a lot of other people, and there's a lot of other people that feel that way who either are here and are not going to, you know, don't feel comfortable speaking or aren't able to be here tonight. And so, um, I, you know, I, I hope that the committee goes back and addresses and bring some more of this information forth before the school board makes a final um, recommendation on this proposal. Uh, the transportation committee, I'm, I'm hoping, I guess I'm offering on their behalf, but um, we would certainly like to be a resource if there are additional questions or ideas that you, know, that you want to bounce, bounce off of us. Um, and I would, I would also encourage looking at other, you know, you presented a slide where you're looking at other schools, but none of them were, were, were young, were little kids. Like, pre-K is four years old. <laughs> your, your proposal calls for 1,200 students. So some, you know, a quarter of them could be four years old. That's really small, and that's a really big building. Um, and I just think that given the magnitude of the cost associated with that and what we would stand to lose by vacating these neighborhood schools is too much. It, give that up. Um, that's my opinion. I, I could certainly get behind, um, you know, any, any recommendation that the school board makes as long as I felt like it was made based on the right information. And I'm just not, I, I don't feel that that's been presented um, yet this far. So again, thank you all for the work that's been done um, in this. And I, and I look forward to hearing more about it and a little bit more public process before we really um, make a decision. Sure. <laughs> so, and I'll just a couple points because we've read the study that you've read, and that's not our presentation. That's the master plan. That sure, I apologize. Four years ago. Terminally. And I will tell you that we also had similar conversations about that study. Um, it assumes certain grade distributions that we weren't comfortable with. We tried to use it to extrapolate financial data out of it. We realized we couldn't use that. So, um, we were with you in the fact that it made some assumptions that we weren't comfortable making along with it. So we tried to glean information that we could as raw data, but not follow its conclusions. Um, the, the, the B and F solutions, you know, that's what you're reminding me that are the topic sure. that we're talking about. Um, so uh, I, don't, I wouldn't look at that as that's what our direction is, is I guess what I'm trying to say. Is that's a study that someone else did four years ago. Um, and it's information we're using, but it's not the solution we're looking for. It's just a heat stop. Um, the other thing is that I was supposed to call you to ask you about transportation times. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I shamed him just a second ago, and now publicly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's his sitting up with us. Um, but I do want to ask where you got the 1,200 children from, because that's not a number I recognize. It's in, it's in the table that compares the different options that were analyzed. Okay. And I, I apologize so if, I'm, if I'm misinterpreting um, okay. that data, but you know, down, the other thing about the option F is that, um, so right here it says 1,200 students in 2025, which with a four year time frame, I mean, that's basically when, you, when you're opening this new school. Right, and so that, what that number assumes is a lot more grades that I'm talking about right now. So that's one of those things that we haven't decided. So 1,200 is not a number we're looking at. Good. So I, you know, <laughs> another one to spell up here. I can't say what the actual number is. I think the enrollment projects is for K to two or seven. Seven. Seven fifty one. Yeah. Like and I think it's also important, sorry, to clarify that like exactly what Andrew said, that that was a resource that we use. But when we are saying that our recommendation, sorry, I'm on the, I'm a board member that's also on the steering committee. Um, when we're saying that our recommendation is to build a consolidated school, we're not saying that our recommendation is option F. Uh, understood. Okay. Um, but that was the information that was available. Yeah. Right. So if you have another option that yeah. you're looking at, I so would love to hear about it. I was saying, we haven't gotten to that point here. So I think what we're trying to do is step by step. And the distribution of grades and how many kids would be in school is a place we're not ready to, to step into yet. But it's definitely an important subject. So we'll definitely, I mean, you have a lot of great points here. There'll be a lot of notes. Yeah. Um, so we definitely move them all. Thank and you for listening. We'll I also. To talk about okay. transportation. Okay. Mm -hmm.
I kind of like it. I'm, ner so. I'm nerdy like that. Um, <laughs> I'd love to talk to you more. <laughs> um, but I also want to thank um, Mrs. Steele for meeting with me when I first started reading through this information. I was just like, wow, this is so much. Um, this stands to really change our community, and I just need to know more about it. Who can I talk to? <laughs> um, and I thought, well, all right, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to call the principal at my son's school and see if she can fill me in. <laughs> um, and she did. And, you know, she met with me within, within a day. I think I told my husband I would be home in like half an hour, and it was an hour and a half later, and he thought I got lost on the path on the way home. Um, so we really appreciated that. She provided terrific insight. Um, and I just, you know, while we were talking, there we were hearing kids laughing outside, sledding down the hill, and the fact that she was able to meet me, I don't know, all, all of it was just very much indicative of what is so important to me about the school structure that we have right now. And that's all. I know that's way more than three minutes, so thank you. Uh, so one thing I just wanted to add really quickly to this conversation, so, because um, the first thing I want to say is, is Ms. Ladd, I echo your impression about the leading nature of that 2017 presentation. And, and actually, over a year ago, when I started uh, and kind of rekindled the Long Range Planning Committee, and I'm the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee, um, when we rekindled that conversation, one of the first things we talked about was that that presentation has a lot of information. I, I might argue it has too much information. For one presentation, it's overwhelming, and it's very directional in the way that it's written. And, and I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but ultimately, it was a good starting place for the conversation and what the committee realized before we even conceived of, of a building steering committee but certainly before we handed off the, the the charge to them was that there was more that was needed to round out that presentation forums like this one and some of the data that the, the steering committees worked very hard to bring together to focus specifically on our primary schools because we knew just like you in reading that presentation that um, it, it didn't give us the the holistic view that we wanted it was far too directional and and uh, in the way it was, was worded. So thank you for bringing that up, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to add a little bit of historical context in the last year to it. Anyone else? Hi, uh, Tim Lambert, Irish Drive. Uh, Iris Drive, not Irish Drive, sorry. Um, and uh, just had a, a question about uh, the referendum that is you know potentially going to be sent to the voters? Is there a dollar attached to that? Uh, do, do we know? I'm nodding, number? and he's looking, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just nodding. looking. Okay. No, 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 it was my fault for yeah. nodding. Yeah. I asked the same question. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. so it, yeah. I, I can sort of. I mean, I, Thank you. so the, yes, there, if if um, if there's a bond question on as a referendum, there is a number attached to it. But if you're asking if we have that number right now, no, we do okay. not. All right. So, so we this is like the beginning of the process. All right. um, and if there, if the board decides to say, yep, can you please move forward with um, looking at a consolidated school, um, the next steps are going to be like the design and how much per square foot that is and, and where it's going to be. And all of those factors are going to give us a much better idea of what the the cost would be okay so uh, you know I'll just throw out a number let's say it's 25 million maybe 30 million it's gonna <laughs> 20 million whatever I don't know what schools cost these days it's been a while I know that this was supposed to cost 20 million um, and it's over budget um, whatever number we throw out there 30 40 50 whatever figure it's gonna be 10% over budget at that point the two million dollars savings that was thrown around before um, becomes a moot point because we're, obviously, we're not going to save two million dollars because you know this. Um, it, it's going to be over budget. So let's let's take that. <laughs> let's let's take that out of consideration. The other thing about sending anything education-wise to the referendum is that it's a major uphill battle to get anybody in this town to approve spending money on education, especially when we're worn down with approving, um, you know, the fire department. Uh, we, I think we just paid nine hundred thousand dollars for a six hundred thousand dollar fire truck um, land use, and then the, the track field, which didn't get approved, um, which wasn't really you know that expensive. Um, so my point being is that if it doesn't get approved, or if it takes several years to get approved, I hope we're not deferring necessary maintenance on our existing facilities. I hope that we're still 
keeping them um, uh, you know, up to par for day-to-day uh, -day occupation. Um, because I've seen that in a lot of places, you know, a lot of towns, where they, eh, they, they let things go, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, wow, it costs millions of dollars to, 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 to fix the problems that we have because you know, maybe we thought we were going to get a new school or because we were just trying to penny pinch. So I just hope that you know, everybody's going to you know, take that into consideration. It's probably not going to pass the first time, so let's make sure we're maintaining the schools. Um, and uh, the former principal of Blue Point uh, made some great points uh, about busing. Um, this came to mind. I, I actually completely spaced about busing until she mentioned it. Uh, because I actually, I grew up, I went to Waterboro Elementary School for uh, three or four years uh, when I was in first through fourth grade or so. And I'm pretty sure I got on the bus in first grade and didn't get off until the fourth grade. It was a very <laughs> long bus ride. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, it was, it was pretty miserable. Um, and unfortunately, now I'm hearing stories of um, kindergartners, uh, Actually, like, I guess this could happen anywhere, anytime, but um, long bus rides right now um, and kids getting antsy and a little bit violent on the school bus. And the school bus is having to pull over and take kids off the bus. Or, um, so I'm just, you know, an even longer bus ride for these little kids. Um, I mean, I know my kid. Um, you know, I'll, I'll drive him from th that side of Scarborough to this side of Scarborough, and he'll be like, are we there yet? Um, so it's, you know, that definitely is a lot for a little kid. And um, I really do like the option of, or I, I, would like to, I would love to see the numbers on the fourth school option. Um, we know that uh, the, you know, huge part of the population growth in this town is because of um, the Downs Project. Um, and, and um, you know, maybe that's an ideal spot for a, a new school. You know, maybe they've got the land for it. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I love that idea of a fourth option, uh, you know, taking some of the kids and bringing them there and then alleviating some of the, the, the stress on the other schools. Um, and I, I think that was my only point. Let me just check my notes real quick make sure I didn't forget anything. My apologies. Just, um, I think that was it. Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank I was you. just going to mention a lot of people have talked about transportation and, um, and busing. And um, it's, it's, a, it's an unknown um, because of a bunch of things. Uh, one is, I mean, Scarborough is a really large town in area, so to a certain extent, um, some bus rides are going to be long longer probably than is comfortable for kids. Um, you know, I think it's like what is it, 54 square miles or something like that. Um, but I also want to say that um, there, there's a lot of things that this is dependent on. Um, one is if there's a new school that's being built, where is that going to be? I mean, um, there, we don't know. So um, there's that question to answer. And then also, I think that, um, like, so when I first started thinking about, this is something that the steering committee talked about also, um, and it's not something that's solved, uh, but it's something that would have to be addressed probably in its own committee, um, a subcommittee on transportation and busing. Um, but ironically, uh, I've come to find out that I think I'm opposite. Most people who have come up here so far have said, like, they're really worried about the bus rides being longer. I assume that the bus rides would all be shorter. Um, because like right now my kids uh, go to Eight Corners and they share a bus with Wentworth and because they're picking up twice as many kids in a smaller uh, physical area and then driving right to school, their bus ride is actually shorter this year than it was last year. So from my perspective, I was assuming that everybody's bus ride was also going to be shorter. But I just want to put it out there that that's an unknown, and um, it's not something that we haven't thought about, and it is something that would have to be addressed <coughs> on its own um, and looked at really carefully. I know that's a lot, a lot of people brought it up, so I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, 
Hi, I'm Josh Galfan, live at 32 in our way. Um, more questions than kind of making a stance. Um, what would happen to the schools if we did a consolidated one? What would happen to the other ones? Any thought? Really good question. Something we've, we've speculated about, but it's really <clears throat> even farther ahead than what we're talking about now. So, so right now the town owns them? They do. OK, so then, OK. Um, and I'm not really familiar with the process of building buildings and municipal processes. Um, so how far along are we in this? Like if we, if the consolidated option is supported right now, does that mean that everything else is put to the side and we're going ahead with that and trying to figure out the details of that? Or are there still flexibility to look into a fourth school or establish more about we like the consolidated school, but this is the best spot for it, and now it's going to take an hour for everyone to get through Oak Hill to go to work and to get to the highway. Right. And so, I mean, issues like Oak Hill intersection, that's a transportation study that we have to be conducted by a traffic engineer. So that's another thing down the road in the process of design. Yeah, so I'm saying, like, where, yeah. like, so, are we here? Like, what? Yeah, we're okay. just, you know, we're looking at chill, using a child as a thing here. Uh, we're crawling we're at that okay. right so there's still room for like there's lateral a lot of room for growth here and understanding okay. of the situations. Um, let's say that everything went speedily and fast. Um, we thought we could answer every question right the first time and get the perfect spot and That'd be nice. address all the issues. Um, we would hope that we could get a referendum this fall. But that would mean uh, probably a year to design something, actually construction documents, and then a couple years to build it. So it's it's still a very long process ahead of us. That's kind of hoping that everything goes exactly right. So okay. that's like the best case scenario. I was talking more like the like the decision making process, not like to, to a, a physical oh, door opening, but as far as like establishing what route we're taking. As far as okay, we we think consolidated school is the way to go you know, and that's it. Again, I think if we unearth problems, it will take longer. Mm -hmm. But I think I can, I can speak to that really quick. We're looking at a vote um, January 2nd as a school board of what direction are we going to charge the committee to go forward with, um, which is really where we came down to having this open forum tonight to get feedback. Okay. I mean, I think if, if you're asking if the, um, say January 2nd, the board says, yep, go ahead with consolidation and the steering committee a month from now is like there's absolutely no land available that meets our requirements or this huge problem has come up that um, that that can be that, that might be reconsidered Correct. based on information that comes right. as we're trying to um, like follow this process I mean okay. we would hope not but like it's not like it, it wouldn't be ignored if there was a huge problem that the committee and or the board <laughs> felt like um, had to change the direction, it would change the direction. It's Correct. not like written in stone. Okay. Is, is that, sorry. I, I think so. None of us are answering. I mean, <laughs> one thing I'll add from the long range planning perspective is that, you know, independent outside of what's going on with the building steering committee, we're also having, we have been for quite a while having conversations about what could our district look like with these different options? So I'll just go with a consolidated school. If we build a big school, and I have the numbers sitting in front of me, um, if we were to do a pre-K through three schools, it's going to be over 1,000 kids before too long. Now, is that something we want? Yes or no? That's a bigger discussion. Um, but certainly, there are other things on the table. We do have three existing schools that we would be vacating. Could one of those become a pre-K center? That's a, that's a topic that's come up and gone around. Um, could we uh, offset some of our, you know, one person, I, I have a name in front of me, I'm going to scroll up my notes because I've been feverishly taking notes uh, for long-range planning. I believe it was Andrea Pettit who said, you know, what, or I think it was actually Kelly Murphy clarified it, when we re-phase, we have to be careful about the different sizes of our students because then you have fixtures that are all too high or too low. And so one of the discussions we've had is, is having our re-phasing efforts be like a single shift. So, for example, if Wentworth, 
if we did build a, a one through three school and Wentworth would have come four through six, then we could have the middle school be seven and eight. That takes care of the middle school's overcrowding and nobody gets shifted more than one grade level. So you don't have the impact on your, on your um, fixtures that you would have if you radically shifted things around more. All of these things are in discussion parallel to what they're doing because we want to make sure that once we have a recommendation from them, we have options about how we can best marry that with our existing resources to be uh, efficient to our community and, and most importantly support student success. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anybody else who wants to say anything before we start going into some of the themes? I'm Nancy Kroll. I'm the director at the Scarborough Public Library. And you did hear from our vice president of the library board earlier, Jim Cupel. Um, I think Jim neglected to mention that we are planning on being on the referendum November 2020. So as the planning process continues, I want to be sure that the two, question, two questions on the ballot will be very challenging. Um, so I just want to be sure that that piece is, is clarified. And we have been working toward that date for well over a year. So thank you. I'm Lorraine DeFreitas. I'm on um, Mulberry Lane. Um, you know, I came here uh, without really, I mean, just excited that you're addressing the overcrowding of the Scarborough schools. I'm new to the area. I've lived here a year and a half. And it's been a great concern of mine, considering I have grandchildren that are not yet in the school system. Uh, so I'm thrilled that you're looking at this question. Um, after sitting here and listening to people, I am concerned as a voter that the option, because one of my questions I had when I came here was, what are the options that have been explo explored? Um, and I must admit, as a voter, I'm a little concerned that the option of a fourth school was not considered. Had been discussed in 2017 at some point, but was not revisited. Um, with this current committee. I also did have concerns about busing, knowing that the neighborhood schools do, you know, save money on transportation and sustainability of, you know, transporting and gas and fuel and all these things that we're concerned about. So those are the two points that I think I'm most concerned about. And I guess I would question, and this little bug was put in my ear uh, just sitting here, uh, what your referendum will be questioning. Will it be saying that you're supporting the consolidation of all the schools, or will you uh, look at the fourth school? I think that's a shorter, may look like a shorter project to me. Um, I, I don't know. In terms of length of time, would that be more feasible um, to the community from the taxpayer's standpoint? Th these are questions I'm leaving with. Um, so I'm not feeling real uh, secure because one option of this fourth school that was considered in the past was not really looked at. Um, or that's the feeling yeah, I, I have. Guess I could a bit that. Okay. No, I think you have to or address all of them. them. Right. Them. Right. So, um, and then you're talking about re redistricting, basically, for that fourth okay. school and so looking at that. Just because it's one of the things that I'm just very curious about. People are talking about the fourth school. Are they thinking that that means one project? No, I think. I for it couch? No, I sure? see it as renovating. You'd have to be you know, looking at the renovations That's in addition <laughs> and how how would you do that so to right right but i don't know how that looks compared to 
building a whole brand new huge school. And, and, and the same issues, you don't, uh, right now, you don't know where this new consolidation school would be. What I see is if you looked at that fourth option of a fourth school, you, you would look at it from the perspective of where would we build this? And, you know, for the standpoint of addressing redistricting. And then you've got some of the piece that you need for this big piece of whole consolidation. So, you know, I'm saying, I, I just wonder if by looking at the fourth school realistically as an option, would you also be addressing some of the questions that you haven't resolved with the larger school in terms of location? Where would it be? And what's the impact on transportation? That's all. I'm just wondering about it. I just that's sort of an opinion, your opinion. Well, I don't know what my opinion no, no, is. It's just I'm concerned just that there's one option there, <laughs> and I don't feel real comfortable with the bigger option right I now. I don't know anymore. My question, I'm going to address it to you, but it's sort of a generic question for now, is do people feel so strongly about the school that they would be willing to pay substantially more or substantially more than a consolidated school? I'm not sure if it would be more. Okay. I don't know. So in, you would feel that? I guess I would cost. think it wouldn't be. Okay. Okay, possible? but I don't know. You'd have to have the cost to renovate the elementary schools right. as well as the cost to build a new school. Do you feel like if it costs more, you'd be willing to pay more to get that solution? Or do you feel like you know, I think I'm of the age where a, a neighborhood school is and is important. Um, you know, I saw that with my kids. Um, you know, so I'm sort of of an age where um, that's. But but I'd like to see both before I put <laughs> on it. I I just yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, looking at the end. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Alex Weber. Um, I live at 11 Serenity Lane. I, uh, this is my first school board meeting, so I, you know, my fear of public speaking here, I, I guess I'm more afraid of possibly angering certain people in this room, so I apologize in advance to my friends and my family. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I think we all identify that there is clearly a problem, and so I commend the steering committee for addressing that. The status quo clearly is not an option. It seems, sounds like the doomsday option is do nothing. Uh, the alternative that I think we're considering tonight is really a, a consolidated school that I'm, I want to learn more about. Um, I, as a, I think we're all stakeholders here and that we're, we are um, residents, we're parents. Uh, I, I consider myself particularly vested here because I have uh, two children, one who is five months old, that will be possibly directly impacted more than most people here who have been through the system already. Um, so I, I feel really compelled to just kind of ask more questions, but learn more before we as a board make any final decision. And it sounds to me just listening, I came here to listen to other people and and I heard a lot of good points. Um, and I think one question I had about the steering committee is, you know, I, I heard some, someone back there on the transportation or planning sounded like she would have been a great, you know, great discussion points for the committee, or maybe a good committee member for that matter. I, I think the vote was unanimous. And to me in this day and age to have a unanimous vote on anything just seems particularly impressive, but I, I'm concerned about, you know, sometimes we, 
develop an echo chamber. We sounds like the community members were all engineers. Uh, it sounds like uh, the not necessarily not all the board any, members, not but that not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. But I think you know we can convince ourselves of anything when we surround ourselves with the same people. I, I've heard a lot of diverse opinions here tonight that don't seem to have been necessarily addressed. But on that note, I don't want to voice opposition to this. I just would like to learn more. I'd like to learn how I can learn more. And I hope we can, you know, for the purpose of just process, really, I mean, this is transformative. I, I think everyone on the steering committee obviously realizes this, otherwise they wouldn't have invested so much time. But when you're personally aff affected, like myself, I do feel particularly strong about, you know, no one's going to advocate for me as much as myself, so, or for my children. So I just want to learn more. Um, I want to, excuse me, I get nervous with public speaking again, but uh, I just want to learn more. I've heard some things today about other school systems and drawing analogies to top five schools. Um, I don't know uh, if that's a model that's appropriate for a town of Scarborough size geographically. Um, are we the same as a Falmouth? I, I don't know that answer. Um, I, I don't know if my, my children, I think, currently would be going to Pleasant Hill. Um, maybe eight corners, depending if they redress district. I, I hear that can happen. Um, I think my children, I, I look forward to them developing these relationships early on in life. Um, and I just, I think this is such a transformative decision and I just really hope that when we have a unanimous vote of 14 to zero on a recommendation, I, I automatically pause and I say, you know, not to question the veracity of the committee, but to really ask if all of these viewpoints that have been raised tonight were actually thoroughly discussed. And they may well have. I'm not part of that process. Uh, I think this is a great process to have community input. Um, but community input, I think, is important on such a big issue like this from the very outset. And so I would have loved to have opinions like um, the woman in the back on the planning committee, um, the principal, uh, my sister over there who's staring at me, uh, you know, but I don't know if I share the same opinion, so I don't know if she's staring at me for other reasons. Uh, that being said, I just want to, you know, again, thank you and uh, just understand that I don't have any illusions that my statements today will make any difference. I, it feels like the wheels of motion are already <laughs> churning. Um, but I, if you can, after this, just provide um, more information about how we can learn about this, how parents who are affected, like myself, directly affected, you know, where, where we can get more information about the options. Um, so it's just, it's a bit of a frightening, uh, thought to not know where your kid's going to go to school now. So I think parenting already at this age is kind of challenging and now I don't know if my kid's going to go to an, an existing school or possibly a mega school, uh, but the doomsday option clearly nobody wants. So uh, that's all. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Can, I, can I just address a couple of sure. points? Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your comments and, and you know, I've felt similarly um, as you at times as a, a parent. And um, I think that as a school board member, one of the challenges that I've had is how to um, engage community members. And I think myself included, at times we're somewhat ambivalent and assume that the machine is operating well and not paying attention till it becomes really relevant to an issue that's personal to us. And so I can assure you that we have been um, engaging in this conversation for quite some time and 
even certainly before this board um, was organized together. Um, and we've been trying to solicit community involvement. And I'm glad that it's worked at, at this point. Um, so th the um, building steering committee um, meetings are open to the public. We post our meetings sure. publicly. Mm -hmm. We post our agendas publicly. We post our minutes publicly. Um, we try to post our supporting documents as well. The school board um, uh, meetings also include that information. Your um, the long-term planning committee meets um, regularly, and I, and it's not practical for right for community members to be involved in all of those things. That's why we have boards and, and various committees. But you're certainly always welcome to email us with any of yeah. your questions and and ask for those um, specific documents. And, and um, do we have? Uh, we've got the slideshow um, under the steering committee. I've I've reviewed the documents okay. and I. I, I went onto your website and I admittedly am late to the game. I feel like this has been sort of a 48 hour crash course in trying to understand the documents and piece it all together and actually what it means. Um, you know, I, it's just not my specialty. Um, that being said, I, I found the materials online to be somewhat uh, confusing okay. for someone just jumping, in, jumping into mm -hmm. it. Um, the slideshows themselves felt very conclusory. Mm -hmm. um, again, is it, do you want the doomsday option or the mega school? Well, I, I'll always choose the mega school mm -hmm. based on the slides. But it seems to be people here who have raised the question about, well, what isn't in the slides? And that's what I'm hoping to try to decipher. And um, it just, it feels like there's, you know, a lot of good questions that were asked tonight. And I think that I think that Leanne's going to bring up some of the the main yeah. themes, and we'll try we'll to have some of the okay. answers tonight. And again, you're and is it too to late to attend email. these meetings? No. As okay, no. so no decision has. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> good evening. My name is Paul Johnson. I'm actually the chair of the town council. Um, I'm nervous speaking because Joanne's here, so bear with me. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a lot harder here than it is over there. Uh, I just wanted, I, I'm not here to speak to the project necessarily, but I, I, I sense that some people are confused about timelines, so there's some interest, and I'm just selfishly just seizing this moment to lay out a couple of projects that are in the pipeline and just to try to educate uh, some people in the room and hopefully at home of where the timeline is for lots of things that are happening. Because um, I think context is important for the, a lot of this stuff. And I, I, sitting in the audience, I can see why there might, there's some gaps, so to speak. Um, so first, first and foremost, I think it's important to realize to the fourth school option, the consolidated school option, um, somebody mentioned Scarborough Downs. There is a clause in our credit enhancement agreement with the Scarborough Downs folks that they are required to hold land for us for a possible school. Um, that size of that land is not defined in the credit enhancement agreement, so I'm not suggesting one way or the other. Uh, but the credit enhancement agreement is readily available online, so I, I would encourage everybody here that is starting to take an interest in this, please read that agreement. Um, and if you're interested in helping provide solutions and input, it's there, it's for the public, it's a legal document. We have 500 acres that we can throw a stone at, so it's worth at least all of us exploring. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, as you may have read in the papers, there is some sort of, there's been discussion around a community center also in the Downs. Uh, I want everyone to be aware that there's a strong possibility that that would be a referendum this coming somewhere between March and June. Um, I'm not saying it's going to go to referendum, uh, but it, it, it's a very strong possibility. It's a large project that's in the millions of dollars, so the logical thing or a possible step would be that would be somewhere between, let's say, March and June of this coming year. Then in November of 2020, which is pretty much a given, is that November 2020, there's a, a referendum for the Scarborough Public Library expansion, which is essentially uh, estimated right now in the capital improvement plan to be around $8 million. Uh, so I know that there's been a few people sp spoke of the Scarborough Public Library. That's pretty much set in stone. November 2020, that will be the $8 million project that is spoken of. I have not heard up here of 
any sort of date for a bond issue for the school that we're discussing. Um, so I don't know when that will be, but my guess is that won't be any sooner than November 2020, and that is up to the committee to decide when that is going to be brought forth. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on a number. I, I will say with absolute certainty it's well above $25 million. Um, <laughs> but, but with that being said, that's the timeline of we have these three very large projects in the pipeline. Um, I'm going to freely admit that this is a struggle, and it takes an uh, incredible amount of cooperation. And uh, Leanne and I have discussed at length that I think it's really important that a lot of members in the community stay involved, give us our input, and it's important for us as community leaders to try to tackle these three projects in a responsible and cohesive manner. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. That's a little bit of information. I know when you're searching online, I know the website's difficult to get around. Uh, as a counselor, I'll try to find something and can't find it at times. So, but please look at the CEA agreement. Look at the information that's available. Realize that we have a two-year timeline, that it's a very intense two-year timeline. Uh, so if this is the catalyst that got you involved or, or, or started raising your eyebrows or your interest, please use this to help us figure out these three massive uh, capital improvement projects that we have in the pipeline. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. Um, just to go back to some of the main themes that we heard tonight, Hillary did discuss the busing, um, that this will be something that we will look at transportation-wise in a subcommittee level. That is not something I think we'd be prepared to speak to tonight. Um, with respect to the size concerns. Sorry, can I just sure. add something? Um, so, I, Alicia had mentioned that all of these meetings are public meetings, and um, if you are super passionate about something um, very specific, and there's going to be a subcommittee, like please take that opportunity to um, get involved um, with any of the subcommittees that are of particular interest to you or that you have experience with. Um, I mean, if it gets to that point. Um, with respect to the size, we've heard from numerous people tonight that that footprint could feel overwhelming. I don't know if you're in a position to speak to some of the thoughts you've had with design. I know you've mentioned a few options. Maybe, or do we want to wait until we... I, I think I'd love to have some decisions that haven't been made yet. Like, how many kids are involved with grades are involved? We'd love if we had an architect and engineer involved to design that project before you really summarize how actually physically big that would be. Are you asking well, I was what talking, can be done to mitigate? The, yes. Yeah. The, well, I was talking more in the line of how would we make a school of this size still oh, feel sorry. as though the children have a community and some smallness. Right. So speak a little bit out of turn, I'm not a school designer, um, but what we've been looking at, things we've been hearing and seeing, um, sort of the one that rises to the top as the most promising is this concept of a school within a school. Um, the feeling is that what you can do is Space, the division of space to keep the, the area for children in the first or second small so that their exposure to school is of a, a, a limited size. Um, but you can use sort of like a hub design to consolidate those central services that all those kids need. So like the administration might be the center of in my head I'm picturing sort of like a three or four legged star and there's a, a center pod or something. The center point would be a thing that all the children's services need, and they could come to the end of their wing and just access that service. But their school would just be the smaller portion of that whole. So even though it's one big building from a construction point of view, um, from a user's point of view, it's just this little portion of it that they're staying in. So that's sort of the idea of the school within the school. So you, you stay within your zone um, without having to travel an enormous amount of distance. It's an issue that's uh, that's a challenge, you know, nationwide all the time. You know, we, we have heard some presentations from architects who have, um, you know, done previous studies here with the, with the town, 
and they've given some examples of, um, of schools that have been very successful in, um, and they've shown us some of the, you know, the plan layouts with the, the wings that, that Andrew was describing. So it's something that is um, a known challenge and has been um, addressed, you know, with, you know, under many occasions, and we, it's definitely part of the design issue. So right now, you know, what the, the step that we're in is, is trying to, you know, to push to get the RFQ out there, request for qualifications, to start to get that chance to have some of these experts who do the design to give us that type of feedback and to, to be able to explore um, these types of uh, these issues. And, you know, just one school you may want to consider on how we, this can be done is when we're Wentworth has wings. I mean, they wings. Uh, but I mean, the the layout of that school is conducive to um, this type of program, where you could, you know, people. You know, I, I have a child in that school, and you know, a couple more that will be there soon. And you know, like somebody mentioned earlier too, that they have wings that they they are in, you know, purple wing, red wing, whatever. You know, they they change some, you know, classrooms. Um, you know, they have two teachers at a time or whatever, so they're, they feel like they're in a small unit as opposed to this large school that the actual physical school holds. I gotta say something. So there, there's definitely concepts to that in terms of design. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just have to say something about a school within a school because Scarborough Middle School, when we built it, and I was the principal, we we built it on the philosophy of a school within a school concept and it was one of the first schools in the state of Maine to be built with a school within a school concept. Unfortunately the growth of Scarborough hindered some of that um, the way it should be but those wings were designed and at the end of the wings were resource rooms and bathrooms so the kids could stay on that wing. They stayed on the wing for three years as sixth, seventh and eighth graders and they came off the wing when they had to come to the rotunda area. If they went one way, it was for art, music, and the cafeteria. Another way was for uh, student support and the gym. But it was one of the first schools built in the state of Maine under the concept of a school within a school. And that's how Wentworth came to accept that, uh, you know, project too. So. And I think that this is um, not something that the committee took lightly when we decided to make the recommendation for a consolidated school. It's something that um, this, you know, this idea of having uh, a much larger K-2 school than what we're currently used to. Um, we talked a lot about it. We did a lot of research about it. Um, we did meet with uh, we did meet with architects who gave us a lot of really um, interesting examples like Andrew and Dave were saying um, on how you can uh, use the design of a building to help make that school feel really accessible and community based for the kids that are in it. Um, and I think that part of the reason that uh, we included the slide about the other schools um, that are close by to us that have a larger population within them, um, I mean, it's important that they are all top five schools and they're all pretty big, but there's lots of other schools in the area um, that have like larger population sizes. Um, and I think that those schools are a resource that we could use. Um, like talk to Village School in Gorham that has 650 kids and, and talk to those principals and ask them, how do you make your kindergartners feel safe and secure and talk to Falmouth. And um, so I, like, I feel like that's also a resource for us um, because this wouldn't be, and, and talk to Wentworth. I mean, we have a school right in our own backyard that is a primary school. It's not kindergarten, but it's primary grades. Um, so I, I just, I just wanted to say that it's not, it's not, it was a concern for us too, and um, it wasn't something that we ignored when we decided, when we ultimately decided to recommend the consolidated school. Thank you. Um, there's been also some discussion tonight about our current facilities and making sure that we're keeping them up to, to code and to standards, and I can't say thank you enough to Todd Jepson's team. Um, our facilities team is managing those buildings beautifully. Some of those buildings are incredibly old and they're running well. Um, so at no point would we let that 
go away. That is incredibly important that our children and our staff are in safe and running well buildings. So I definitely want to make sure that that's being addressed. Um, with respect to the information getting out, that was a recurring theme, and I will make sure that we're getting more information in different channels for people to get more acclimated to this information. Um, it has been going on for a while. I am so grateful that people came out tonight for the emails that we have received from the community, um, whether they were in support of or challenging some of the questions. Um, this engagement is, it's invaluable to have the engagement and for the community to be part of this process. Um, with respect to timelines, I recognize that this seems as though we're going quickly. I also understand that the library is on for 2020. We are trying to respond to the growth in this town. We are growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, new housing starts continually. We are having massive development stones throw away, as Paul mentioned. And it would be unconscionable for this board to not act and act quickly to make sure that our students are cared for. Um, as Andrew had and has mentioned through this, it's going to take some time. We are going to need to design it and find the land and build it. This is a five-year project, most likely. We need to react soon to make sure that those students have a seat when they come to us. Um, I believe we've covered all the pieces. I don't know if there's anything that anyone else wants to mention. I do. I, I was I hoping that maybe Todd Todd, <laughs> if I could put if I could put you on the spot a little bit, if you could talk about the concept of the fourth school and what that would mean for renovations plus building in, in terms of that that discussion. That's my question also. Oh, perfect.
So I don't think anybody can argue that the new Wentworth is a better option than the old Wentworth. The question is, do you want another Wentworth type building that is serving students really well uh, at a size that can accommodate the growth of the town? So I don't know that I've answered your question, but I, but I do believe it's something that we have discussed, certainly with the Long Range Facilities Planning Group and also with the Steering Committee. Could, the, could you describe the process of renovation? First of all, I guess a couple of things. One, could you talk about like the the energy efficiency? I found that um, information really informative, right. just sort of from a lay person. Yeah. So I think you could talk about where we're at in those buildings in terms of that that piece. And then if you could talk about what would be involved for the renovation, if you could address those issues, how you would manage the students for their programming if you did, and, and could you address the safety issues by adding the fourth school and renovating as well? If the, those are a couple of the. So the energy efficiency levels of the existing K-2 schools, they have R3 insulation in the walls, uh, which is way below standard. I think it's supposed to be R20. Um, so if you're going to do a renovation wisely, uh, you would tear the walls apart from either the inside or the outside, whichever is the best and most efficient, and re-insulate properly so that you're not heating the outdoors. Um, so, so, so again, decide how, how efficient do you want to make the existing schools. Um, and the second part of your question, Alicia, was about safety for a fourth school. Um, what, um what the, what the renovation would entail in terms of keeping the students in or moving them around, what that does for the cost, and then what, what if you're doing the renovation, how well can you address the safety concerns? So I, I have not partic participated in that type of renovation, but when I got here, uh, many of you probably remember the old Bestworth building before when it was kind of right down where the Wentworth playground is. And it was a series of modulars that joined. You can tell me if this is true, but those buildings were put there to house the second grade during the primary school renovation in the early 90s. Correct. And what you did with the K and first grade students, I don't know, but it would have to be a phased process <laughs> where you would you would literally, if you decide to renovate Pleasant Hill School, for example, you, you couldn't do it with the students there. You would have to find a temporary home for them for the period of renovation. So you're right, it would add additional costs. Do you just put a string of trailers on the old Wentworth Drive down by the turf field and have second grade down there? And there are huge considerations because what do you do for a playground for those kids? Where do they go to gym? Where do they eat? Gorm is actually putting four modulars together for a cafeteria. So again, you can do whatever you want I have the philosophy that anything is possible with time and money. So how much time do you want to take and how much money would you like to spend? Because it's a real, it's a real question. And um, the security is something that, again, depending on what kind of space you place those children in for the renovation period, it's really going to determine your level of safety. I know when they were renovating the high school and evading the asbestos flooring, they went to SMCC for a while, or uh, SMBTI, or something like that. They went we to did double else. sessions. Double sessions, thank you. That's right. I remember someone telling me they went to SMBTI, but it was probably South Portland instead. It was both. What's that? It was both. Both. So anyway, there are so many options to consider. None of them are free. <laughs> That's the unfortunate part. So no matter what you do, it's going to cost you money. You either keep doing what you're doing money or you pick an option and go after it and pray you have good community support. Well the other cost that I think is really important and actually it was Principal Ketch that brought this up. We've had a lot of conversations in long range planning and a few stand out in my head and one is when she actually spoke and said when we renovated the high school we had to kind of shuffle kids around kind of on a round robin through a series of portables and to other facilities and that really got me thinking about the student experience and there's a cost associated with that. Would we take five years to renovate one school or if we have to stagger them and it takes even longer, those are classes and classes of eventual Scarborough graduates who have those formative years of their education in 
impacted by the fact that their schools are operating while under construction. And, and money is an important cost, of course, but I, but I was really taken aback by the thought that went into not just what she said, but all the time I'd spent thinking about it afterward and what renovating those schools would mean for the students that spend their primary school years in a construction zone. to say that something I think that we need to focus on is that this isn't just about like buildings and taxpayer dollars and all that stuff it's about students like these are students lives that we're talking about like when they go to school school is their life like that's where all of their friends are that's where they do basically everything in their life so like 
after the initial meeting where we brought it up, I went home and I was talking to my mom and I was like, what do you think about it? And she was like, I don't like it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, because I had seen it. I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Like, I, I think that's probably a good decision. And she was like, I just like the community feel of the smaller schools. And I was like, I thought about it. And I do somewhat agree that like, my sister, she is in um, second grade at Pleasant Hill right now. And she's not shy, but I'd say she's a very timid girl. And she, um, in like the lunch room, which is only like half the school, she's very overwhelmed. And I know a lot of other students feel that way. So I don't know how that's gonna be in a school with like 750 kids where it's gonna be like a huge amount of kids in one lunch room that's gonna be very loud, a lot of like, overstimulation for kids with lots of energy and everything and I I don't know I think the idea of having like schools within schools is good for like classroom life I don't know how that would look for like playground or gym time or in the cafeteria because I think that would be an area where students would have issues so I think that's something we have to consider great point thank you okay. anything else from the board are we, are we just making general comments? I have some. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> okay, so I, I speak for myself personally, obviously, but I know that there are other members of the board who feel this way. Um, but I want to be really careful to give off the impression that this is, that this design and this setup was, was to explain away people's concerns. Um, you know, and, and we've talked so much about how we can engage the community in a meaningful way that, that is more of a back and forth, that isn't just people at the podium and then us making a decision that seems like it's in isolation. And so I want to I want to make sure that I, at least from my own perspective, you know, really highlight that I, I am taking all of the public comment into consideration. I, I think it's great that we had the, our, you know, uh, our experts here to answer some of these questions. Um, I love that we poked holes in, you know, the process, and so this is this is in, this is helpful, and this is an enriching conversation for me as well, and not just this was not just for the community. This really was for us. Um, so where I where I kind of am right now is there are there are pros and there are cons, and we as a board are charged with weighing. What are the pros and what are the cons? And what are those things that are really kind of just ultimately going to be the deal breakers? Because I'm never going to have all the answers. Like, we could drag this out another year, and I wouldn't know for certainty that the children in the cafeteria aren't going to feel anxious. We can, you know, we can come up with solutions, and we can have those important conversations about how to mitigate those problems. But I'll never, ever be able to say with 100% certainty you won't sit at the Oak Hill intersection for three exchanges of the light. Like, that's so far beyond our scope. But what I can say is, for me personally, I cannot imagine the idea of renovating the schools and having the kids attend the schools for the next five years, three years. Even if we did Pleasant Hill, then Blue Point, then Eight Corners, and we tried to balance and make it equitable, for me, that's my deal breaker. And so when I think about, you know, all of the potential problems that could arise, I, I have been in all three of the primary schools. I have seen the challenges firsthand. We just did budget outreach session, sessions at the schools, and the teachers are begging for more space. When we put 22 kids in a kindergarten class, there's not even enough cubbies for each child. You know, so and, and so it's the level of renovation, and we, when we talk about the nuts and bolts of it, which is so far over my head in terms of what grade insulation we have or whether the windows are casement, what I care about is, my, is these kids, and I think to myself, are these buildings adequate? You know, can, can, what level of renovation is gonna be required to bring them up to a place where I can say confidently, we are doing the best for these kids right now? And so, not to stand on my soapbox, and I certainly am not trying to dismiss the concerns and all of the great conversation that we've had. Um, I just kind of want everyone to know where I, where I sit and kind of my thought process going into this. And so 
that's where I'm at. I mean, we've had so much good conversation. I look forward to furthering the discussion and making sure that we bring the community along with us. And I'm really open to suggestions for how to do that. Um, com communicating this is going to be a giant um, task and I, I want to do it right. Um, and so hopefully, you know, tonight was a, a good experience for everybody and, and I'm not the only one kind of sitting here thinking, okay, like this was really enriching for me. Um, so, Just to piggyback on that, I'm going to thank folks for humoring me because, yes, I said three minutes and definitely didn't hold to it um, because I didn't want to stop that conversation. There were great points being made. There was a lot of passion in what was being said, and it would be, I needed to hear it as well. It was really important to take in all this information. It has given me um, plenty to do over the next few days of vacation. Um, as far as getting ready for our next conversation on the 2nd of January, because there, there were so many wonderful points. So I really am thankful that folks were able to come up and they had so much to say and to share. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah. And I'd even go a step further that this is going to impact people who don't yet know they're going to be having children. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is really a, this is a very large whole community conversation. Um, and I think, yes, we need to get very creative on how we get this message out and broaden how we reach people. I, I just will add that um, it's something we think, I'm on, commun on the communications committee, and it's something we think about a lot. Um, I mean, a lot of the times our communication is, you know, kind of district-based, and we kind of have that covered. Um, but there's also times where we want to get the word out to the community or to people who, you know, don't have kids or have younger kids that aren't in the school yet. Um, and that's something that is a real struggle. So. We try to get information out to preschools um, to work together with preschools, uh, but you know we work together. We try to work with the Scarborough preschools. I know some somebody just tonight mentioned their kid goes to preschool in another town. Um, so I'm just I don't know. Um, we've kind of thought of what we can think of, and um, I guess what I'm saying is that if you have ideas, then we would really love to hear them because. Um, we that is something that we talk about a lot is like how do we get to that section of the population that doesn't have kids in school yet or doesn't have kids in school period thank you thank you so much for coming out tonight i know it was a long night um but i think this was super helpful we still have a couple pieces left but um it's real quick promise it's just meeting minutes um we'll otherwise let you I'd... guys go <laughs> yeah. so if you'd like to leave feel free um that said if the board is willing 8.1 8.2 i'd like to make that a single motion to accept the meeting minutes of the workshop of november 21st and meeting minutes of our business meeting also of november 21st second, second. and, <laughs> and all those in favor you know us 9.0, is there a motion to adjourn tonight? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.